Eugene Brown Trimmy uh, has been awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest award given to a civilian uh, for her courageous efforts in helping integrate high schools. And as a direct result of her efforts, we all have the great fortune of going to this incredible first school in South Carolina High School. And as I bring her up, um, I was watching a, uh, she's been on the TV, she's in the news all the time, and one of my favorite quotes from Minnie Jean of all time is that someone had asked her, why do you think that the students at Little Rock Central High School um, targeted you, went after you? Uh, and she said, because she was uh, tall, beautiful, and proud. So it's my pleasure to introduce her. <laughs> Thank you, that's so sweet. Woo. Woo. Oh my God, yes! Oh my God. Woo. Thank you. You know how that makes me feel? It melts my heart. <laughs> um, I, today I'm going to talk about, um, for those, my old friends and my new friends, you know how I do this, for the old people who've seen, older people who've seen me, is I don't know what I'm going to say, and I open myself up to what's possible, and allow some greater force, whatever we call it, to speak through me. And we're talking about transformation. I, you have my deepest sympathy because you've had a rough year. Uh, you've lost your friends, you've lost people you love. And I think about that and my heart goes out to you. When we talk about transformation, you know, we have the story of the Little Rock Nine 50 years ago, my time flies. I can't believe it was 50 years ago. But we mostly look at transforming a very ugly, brutal situation into a positive, into meeting violence with nonviolence, brutality with love, and I, I just want to start with a story about my own daughter who was in a tragic car accident. She didn't die, I'll say that at first. But they said she would. And of course, because uh, she was all smashed up. And mother, you know, hysterical, looking really pained and hurt. And when she got off the ventilator, she said, Mom, no matter how sorry you feel for me, you cannot be me. And I need you to help me. And I was really shocked by that and, you know, lost in my own grief. But then I realized I had a lot of work to do. I had to support her in so many ways. I had to find a way to take care of her son. And I had to um, be strong so that she could heal. So when we think about grief, we're allowed that sorrow. We are absolutely allowed that. But I want to talk about transforming grief into service. And I don't know how you do that. But there are some little brothers and sisters of the children who've passed away who need somebody to take them to the movies. I was thinking about what would I do? And so I'm going to propose that each of you, in your own way, make a pact. It's your personal thing, write it down. To make an A in the class that you hate, to find a way to serve humanity in some way. Because no matter how sorry you feel, it's what you do with that sorrow that's going to make the difference. So just do it to yourself 
And if you have the nerve, and this is all suggestion, if you have the nerve, when you've accomplished that goal, go and tell the people who love those children, this is what I did to honor my friend. And it's just transforming sadness and grief into service. There's an expression in the Bible, and I'm, I'm not really religious. I think we're having maybe some feedback because I have two mics on. There's a, an expression that I heard a long time ago. It's called turning plow, oh, swords into plowshares. Well, I'm a farm woman. I used to be a farm woman, and a plow is a thing that you use to open the ground up to plant food. And in our society, or in the world, we have a couple of phenomena. We have huge expenditure on weapons, but a lot of people who are hungry. So that, that symbolism of turning swords, which I think right now we could call weapons, into, and we could also call it money, that if we can turn those things into food for thought, if we can serve the world by feeding it, if we can serve the world by not violating our neighbor, if we can serve the world in the smallest way, we have transformed the world. So that sounds really lectury and preachy, and so we'll get off that. And I'm going to pass it to you, and then we'll have this discussion that uh, you know me, you know how I like it, so I need you. Well, let me just say something about hugs, too. <laughs> I need every hug I can get. And we all do. There are some people who look at mental and physical health who say that we need five hugs a day to survive. So keep that in mind. And I'll take my five as soon as we're done. Express, tell, share, love. So here we go. Let the wild rumpus start. So if Anybody would like to ask me, give me a question about anything that she has addressed here, about her experience at Little Rock, what she's did, done since Little Rock, and what her plans are for this September 50th or beyond. Uh, it would be your opportunity to ask me a question. Don't everybody raise your hand at once. <laughs> Come on up. Hi. Um, now, I know how you feel about silent witnesses. I want to know um, about how many of the students uh, were harassing you out of the couple thousand that, that went to Little Rock. Okay, great question. Do you know what about silent witnesses? Okay, let me just give you a quick um, rundown. Ellie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor, said sometimes it's not the people who do the bad things, it's the people who stand by and do nothing, the people who are indifferent. And that's a good question because in the day-to-day -day experience at Central High School, the Little Rock Nine decided that we will say that there were 20 nice kids, well, about 50 to 75 bad kids, those are the ones who would kick you down steps or spit on you or whatever kinds of little teenage terror they could think of, and then 1,900 students who stood by and said nothing. And it is precisely that concept of indifference that says to the people who were the 75 harassers, that's okay because we're not going to intervene, we're not going to say anything, we're going to allow you to do that. So I, I, I appreciate that question. But here's a really sad story about Ellie Wiesel. 
He spent a lifetime talking about peace, wanting peace greatly in his life. And not too long ago, he was attacked and he kept screaming for help. And nobody helped. Nobody came forward. Now he's um, close to 80, I think. Imagine how broken his heart is after spending a lifetime with that work and calling for help and having nobody come. So I know in my heart of hearts that you will never do that because you know the cost of standing by and doing nothing. So you will be witnesses. You will do testimony. You will not stand by and do nothing. I appreciate that. And that's my challenge to you. Thank you for a good question, Nick. Anybody else question like to ask Minnie Jean? Come on down. And whoever asked the question said Minnie Jean said she needed five hugs a day. This would be a great opportunity. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is that, uh, what kept you going? What was your motivation to like, continue to go to school every day at Little Rock, even though you face that every single day? Another great question. Ah, you know, resistance is a funny thing. Resistance is the way we survive very difficult situations. And everybody calls it courage, and people says we were brave. Sometimes I think we were just stupid. <laughs> but the way we sort of survived was to make jokes of what was going to happen. We also, we got a brief teaching on nonviolence in February, actually. And the person who taught us said, we just met him at the Museum of Tolerance a couple of years ago, and we said, he said, when do you think I taught you nonviolence? And, and we said, well, you know, it must have been in October. He said, no, it was February. And when I got there to teach it to you, you'd already developed the skills to walk through brutality in peace and in nonviolence. So I thought, wow. And people say, well, how did you develop that strength? And how did you develop that courage? What I say is, I didn't develop anything. It was already there. I, and you know what I mean? You know you got it too. All you need is to have the test come, and that steel rod go, goes up through your back, and you can do anything you want. And we also had these weird ways. Like we say, huh, I wonder what they're going to think of today. And then we had, uh, some of you have met Elizabeth Eckford. Her picture is, is in Mr. Gray's room. And she had a thing called creative nonviolence. We used to get body slams against the locker, and they'd always come from the front. Don't tell anybody. But Elizabeth and her sister put pins in her binder. You couldn't see them, but boy, did the body slams Stop. <laughs> so that wasn't an aggressive act. That was a protective act. That was all you could think of to stop the body slams. So how did we do it? To tell the truth, I don't know. What I can tell you is when I see those beautiful kids, those very sweet, innocent 14, 15, and 16 year olds in photographs and on films, I say, wow, I admire them. They're so cool. Wow, I don't know who, I, I don't know how we did it. But resistance is an amazing thing and it will come up in you when you need it. So just keep that in mind. You've got it. If I had it, you've got it. Okay? That's a promise. Thank you. <laughs>
How has this experience affected your social skills? <laughs> How has it affected my social skills? One, I try to truth tell, you know. Nobody is going to have me on their panel and I say uh, things that don't have any meaning. And it's kind of scary sometimes when people, we had a, in Little Rock, we had a reconciliation event. And I'm saying, we can't reconcile until you admit something happened. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> and that it was necessary and that it is necessary for society to look at its truths. Because it's from though we grow from that, we change from that. Our world transforms uh, because of people speaking up, stepping forward. I... St <laughs> How has it affected me? I am in trouble all the time. Um, because I cannot be counted on to be a silent witness. You know, you're looking at a 50-year anniversary. A lot of people are wanting to say, oh, it wasn't that bad. And I was one of the people who was nice. And there weren't 75 kids who were doing the bad things. And all the people who were in the mob were from out of town. Well, I'm not going to buy it. Little Rock was an event that showed us as a nation who we really were, are that if you can behave in such a manner that women, white women wearing gloves, screaming obscenities to kids, I always said nine of us in 2000, nothing was going to rub off, okay? Do you know what I mean? The blackness was going to stay on me and the whiteness was going to stay on them. And that I did not I was not a threat. So in Eyes on the Prize, there's this brilliant young white kid who says, you know, when we freed the slaves, we made a mistake. Wow. Because it's been proven that black people don't have the mental capacity to think. And I said, well, oh my God. <laughs> okay, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's cool to, and it turned out to be one of the strategies. I saw him and said, oh no, I'm not intellectually inferior. I do have the capacity <laughs> to think. And so you look for signs and you look for hints. Uh, I had a, I, I was telling Mr. Gray, I was at a, panel and this college president said and when we see boys with their pants hanging low I tell them to pull them up I said well that's not an institutional response to a huge problem and I said since when that the level of pants on the butt determined the brain size <laughs> and that as much as I find low-hanging pants to be weird <laughs> and if not like scary because I'm always afraid that you're gonna lose them <laughs> uh, but I've been I've done things <laughs> that freaks people out in my youth and look at me now I mean my pants are up you know and So that, that, um, let's be really careful about deciding who people are based on their look. So just stuff like that. So yes, it's affected me. I'm way too compassionate. My mouth is way too big. <laughs> but I like myself anyway.
the uh, Sojourn trip, one of your colleagues and one of your friends, Elizabeth Eckford, uses uh, a great line, and I was I was wondering if you could comment on it for, for everybody here, and that is that ordinary people can do extraordinary things, and oftentimes, and I know that we've had this conversation where the folks have looked at you in a hero status, or a shero status, excuse me, and I was wondering if you could comment on ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Okay, for those of you who, who've been on Sojourn, or who have seen me before or run into me on the street, any number of things. I go on the 10 day trip on Sojourn to hang with the young people so that they can see that I'm a regular person and that I don't have any, I'm not a, I don't have an S on my chest or a spiders or any of that. <laughs> that I'm a regular person. You know, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I've had tragedies in my life and good things in my life and all those things. And to me, that whole idea of being with the Sojourn kids so that they can see themselves in the great change that we are making in our society. So Elizabeth, We, are, we always emphasize that. 14, who's 16 in here? Okay. Anybody 15? Okay. <coughs> I would say young people today face much harder things in society than we did at Central. And you're ordinary. I'm ordinary. You come from a range of ethnicities. You have all the, oh gosh, thank goodness I went to Central so I can look out at a room like this. And. and Uh, there's a, a California uh, court decision, Supreme Court California decision from 62 years ago called Mendez versus Westminster. And it's about a group of Latino families who fought to end segregation in California schools. Because, and I want to tell you that I don't know about here, but in Orange County, the Mexican kids could only go to the swimming pool on one day. It was kind of like Little Rock in the 50s. We couldn't go to the swimming pool. They sat in the balcony of the theaters. They couldn't go to the beach except on certain days. And the schools were segregated and they were inferior. So a group of five families did a lot of the work to cause a court decision to be made that outlawed segregation in California schools. And I'm going to tell you all the groups it affected. It affected Latino students. It affected black students. It affected Asian students. It affected American Indian students. Did you know about that? How many knew about that? All right, you go find it out, okay? Go on the internet and look for Mendez v. Westminster. And so we are all part of a common struggle. Schools being a really important site of the need for social change. And we're all in this together. And I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect answer, right? Fortunately, yeah. we have about uh, 10 minutes left, um, so we're going to move to a little bit of a different part of the program here. Um, Minnie, Minnie Jean has been very nice to come, and she is giving herself.
to all of us so that we can share our experience. So what we want to do it now is we're going to turn it around. And if anybody in the audience would like to come forward, I'm going to ask you to uh, pick one word that you would think that would describe Community Jean, uh, what she means to you, what she means to us, uh, and then name that word and then you can explain that to her. Uh, would anybody like to come? Thank you. Come on up. Goodness, thank you. <laughs> hey. Hey, how are you? Real. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Because um, you hear this amazing story of everything you did, and to see you and actually hear you speak, and it makes it more real, you know, like what you said, an ordinary person doing extraordinary things. Thank you. Nice to meet you. My word for you is hope um, that I'll become somewhat like you, not in every aspect, but somewhat like you to change other people and hope that you know, I just can become a lot better like you. Thank you. like you were an ordinary student going to a high school, we're all ordinary here and we could all change in any way we want. Thank you. Um, courageous because it took a lot of courage to actually go to that school with over 2,000 kids with only nine of you to actually stand up and change the whole world for that. Thank you. If you want to wrap up, I've got a couple of minutes left. Did you want to say anything in conclusion? Yeah. I need you to stay inspired to keep doing the work I have to do. I thank you for allowing me to be with you and have this discussion. And I wish you well. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all very much. You guys are a fantastic audience. Uh, students, if you enjoyed the presentation, raise your hand. All right, very good. When you leave here and you go back to your classroom, we'll excuse them all. Everybody needs to go back to the room and be excused at 6 30 from there. Make sure you thank the teachers for giving you this opportunity. One more time, as many as you proud.